afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the Jefferson Building and thank you for those of you joining us on Zoom. The Kluge Center was founded in 2000 thanks to a generous donation from philanthropist John W. Kluge. We bring scholars from around the world to Capitol Hill for a period in residence to work with our vast collections and to interact with the public and with policymakers. We also administer the Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity, which we will award this summer. Today, Kluge's Andrew Briner will talk with Zach Schrag, Professor of History and Director of the MA Program at George Mason University about his book, The Fires of Philadelphia, Citizen Soldiers, Nativists, and the 1844 Riots Over the Soul of a Nation, published in 2021. Zach was in residence at the Kluge Center in 2009. The Fires of Philadelphia discusses a nativist uprising in the city over concerns that another ethnic group, in this case Irish Catholics, would deplete their social and political power. The event foreshadowed the coming Civil War. Thank you, Dr. Schrag, for joining us. Andrew? Brent. Hi, I'm Andrew Briner. Um, yeah, so I, I truly enjoyed reading The Fires of Philadelphia, and I found in it a number of different stories about America, which are all very relevant today. Um, it includes a history of mob violence, a history of the attempts to quell mob violence using militias and police forces, um, the rise of the temperance movement against alcohol, the first major anti-immigrant movement, the violent anti-abolition movement that preceded the U.S. Civil War, um, a fight over what's taught in public schools and the place of religious minorities and parental choice in schooling. Um, so I want to start by asking, um, what drew you to the topic of these 1844 riots, um, particularly when your previous books looked at institutional review boards and the DC Metro in the later 20th century? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It is great to be back here at the Kluge Center where this book really took root originally. Um, so yes, I did start out as a 20th century historian, and I was originally planning to write about riots in the 20th century. They're an important part of American history, especially American urban history, of course, the riots of the 1960s especially. And I thought I would have maybe a preliminary chapter about riots in the 19th century before tear gas, before rubber bullets, before a lot of the riot technologies that we see today. But sometimes a historian thinks that they're going to write a little preliminary chapter and the story turns out to be a lot more complicated than they thought. Uh, my second plan was to write a book that would be half in the 19th century and half in the 20th. And chapter two would be about Philadelphia in 1844. And then that story just wanted more space than a chapter could give it. So it expanded into a book length project and really opened my eyes to a lot of things in the 19th century that I had not even imagined existed. That's great. Yeah, so you were a Kluge Fellow back in 2009, and um, I understand that uh, the seeds of, of this book were, were there even at that point. Um, and it's clear you put your experience with the library's collections to work in this book. Um, so what kinds of sources did you draw on, um, and in particular, what from the library? So uh, the Library of Congress is a fascinating place. It is composed of multiple divisions with different kinds of sources. There are books, of course, uh, some of them in the general collection, and then rare books. Uh, many of them were being digitized at the time I was here, so now those are available to everyone. Uh, there are maps, including some fantastic maps of Philadelphia in the period that I was exploring. There are prints and photographs, including a copyright deposit version of the most famous lithograph of the riots done in the summer of 1844. Uh, there's also a daguerreotype of one of the characters in the book. And uh, then there are probably most important for me, uh, manuscript collections, including some of the letters of Morden McMichael, who was sheriff at the time of the riots, as well as manuscript works by a previous historian of the riots, who uh, never published his work, so it was great to work through his notes. And then, most important of all, newspapers. Um, the 1840s were a time of an expanding press, uh, both daily papers, the penny press, uh, bi-monthly, bi-weekly papers, all kinds of things. Uh, one of the most interesting sources that I actually came to after the Kluge Fellowship, but that's here in the library, is a nativist paper that began publication in the summer of 1844, um, immediately after the riots. And I, I originally thought, oh no, this is too late for me. And then I realized that no, this newspaper 
spent the first six months of its existence parsing three days in July of 1844 in copious detail what it meant, who was there, who saw what. And that's a newspaper that, to my knowledge, has never been microfilmed, uh, much less digitized. I was there turning pages very carefully of this 1844 newspaper. And I, I think the Library of Congress has the only copy in the world. Wow. It's always great to hear about the unique things that the library has. Um, so yeah, you, you started mentioning the riots, so um, let's sort of set the scene. Um, what's going on in democratic culture, in the political parties, in immigration, in the US in this era, and particularly in uh, major cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore and New York? So I, I think of this period, people often call it the Jacksonian period, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, of a kind of reinvention of the United States. Uh, part of this is generational. In the 1820s, you have Daniel Webster up at Bunker Hill saying that the great trust descends into new hands. The veterans of the Revolutionary War are dying off. Adams and Jefferson, of course, die on the same day in 1826. And so you've got this new generation trying to figure out how to run the country without that founding generation to guide them. They don't even know where the country ends. You have disputed borders, both with British North America on one side and Texas and Mexico on the other. Uh, you have debates about African Americans, about women, about Native Americans, about Mormons, and then about all of these immigrants who are coming in from all different countries in Europe, but primarily from Ireland, uh, reaching the Atlantic uh, seaports. And there's also this new invention of the mass political party that we have the, the first party system under Jefferson and Adams that kind of fades away. It comes roaring back in the 1820s and 1830s with what become the Democratic and Whig parties. They're not in the Constitution. People don't know if there's supposed to be a two-party system. Maybe there should be more parties and people are founding new parties as well. And they're also not sure how this coalition will work out. Who will be a Whig? Who will be a Democrat? There's some sense that the Whigs are the party of capital, the Democrats are the party of labor, but there are a lot of other allegiances that people could form to make that decision for them. And then this is a period of mass immigration to some degree, right? Because it, it increases much more, especially from Ireland in, in coming decades, right? Right, so the Napoleonic Wars had really put a stop to immigration. Um, obviously it was dangerous to cross the ocean in the middle of the war, people were being drafted into the armies. But after 1815, there's a lot more migration, not only to the United States, but also to British North America, what we would now call Canada, as um, various people in, in Europe, Germans, English, Scandinavians, but especially Irish, are looking for new opportunity. The population of Ireland is growing very rapidly. The economy is not, so millions of Irish are leaving the island, island either to go east to England or west to Canada and the United States. Yeah, and so this, this brings us to Lewis Levin, who I found to be a very interesting character. Um, I, think, I think readers of the book will find a lot of similarities with sort of current anti-immigrant movements and ideologues in, in Levin. Um, so could you outline the, the course of Levin's sort of early life, how it brings him to be a central figure in this nativist movement? So uh, Levin is born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1808. He is the son of Jewish immigrants from England. You might think that he, that would make him more tolerant. Uh, you would be wrong. Uh, he has a, a stormy youth. He goes to college. He has a dry goods store. He starts two schools. He gets in a duel. He reads law. He <laughs> wanders around multiple states. Uh, he ends up in Baltimore, seems to be doing well for a while. Uh, he's a member of the bar. He's in the directory, but he's also getting in knife fights with other lawyers. Uh, that is making his name in not a good way. And for whatever reason, he, he ends up in Philadelphia sometime around 1840. And, and he's drinking. Um, he says this very explicitly later on. And he says, yeah, this was the bad time in my life. I was drinking too much. I was fighting. I was gambling. Uh, he goes bankrupt. And he's basically picked up off the floor of a tavern, um, probably by the Reverend John Chambers, and probably converts to Christianity around this time. A lot of the details of his life are, are hard to pin down. But he seems to have a religious awakening. He gives up drink and indeed becomes a temperance advocate as a reformed drunkard, he says, look, I, I you know, regained my life by giving up drink, you should too. And he also becomes a newspaper editor, and this is his fourth or fifth career at this point. Uh, it's not a very lucrative career, um, writing temperance magazine. You know, People are 
subscribing to the magazine but not paying their bills. And then he finds this new cause, which is saying bad things about Irish people. Uh, originally, he, he attacks Daniel O'Connell, who's the great liberator in Ireland who's trying to win more autonomy within the British Empire, and then later he starts attacking Irish immigrants, but he's actually a little late to that cause. I, I see him as some, one of, something of an opportunist who will seize a cause where he thinks the votes and the money are and use his considerable talents as a speaker and a writer to gain popularity that way. Yeah, I thought something that I found striking about Levin that, that you describe really well is um, I get the impression of him as somebody who is very eloquent and charismatic and who is kind of looking for something to apply these skills to and, you know, in that way kind of moves from the temperance movement to this nativist movement. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how he sort of seizes on this and how it sort of helps his, you know, personal profile? So, yeah, we have some character sketches of Levin from his youth. Everyone who writes about him marvels at what a good speaker he was, and he is compared to some of the great orators of the day, Webster and Clay and, and the others. Um, but he does jump around from cause to cause. When he's in the South, he's defending states' rights in South Carolina and all of that. Um, then for a while, he makes his name uh, as a temperance speaker, warning about demon rum. But Meanwhile, other people are forming this anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant movement, and I think a key moment for Levin is when he takes a trip to New York City for Washington's birthday in 1844. He's invited to give a talk on temperance, and he sees in New York a robust anti-immigrant uh, movement. Uh, now, in those days, people called themselves nativists. It's a very hard word to say. I wish they had picked less of a tongue twister, um, which meant that Technically, they didn't want to stop immigration. Again, I don't take these people's word at face value, but technically right. they said it was okay for people to come to the United States, but they shouldn't be allowed to vote until they had been in the United States for 21 years, hmm. not five years, 21 years to become a citizen and vote, and they probably shouldn't be able to hold public office even right. after that. So um, Levin casts his lot with this cause, and although he's not an official member of the party, he becomes one of the leaders of the nativist movement in Philadelphia that gains great strength in the spring of 1844. Meanwhile, in New York, the nativists are doing even better. They elect a mayor of New York in April of 1844 as a third party candidate, defeating both the Whigs and the Democrats. And I think this really energizes the Philadelphians to say, if New York can elect nativists, we can too. Hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, you mentioned that nativists is hard to say. I also found the fact that they frequently refer to themselves as Native Americans uh, very confusing. <laughs> yeah, this throws a lot of people. And as 20th century, we think of Native American as referring to indigenous people. Um, there's a little bit of self-consciousness in there where the nativists are saying, oh yes, there was this you know, delegation of Indians. They're the true Native Americans. But yeah, meanwhile, we're going to keep using that term. Right. Um, and what do you see as the origins of nativism? Where is it coming from sort of in American history and culture? So this is very hard because, again, I don't believe the people on about what they say about themselves, which is hard for a historian, but sometimes you have to do this. Mm -hmm. Officially, they are against immigrant rights. They think that anyone born in another country, especially another monarchy, is not going to be a true American, that if you are born under the rule of the King of England, you can't be a good American. But the very next paragraph is always some kind of slur on Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And so part of the ideology here is that Catholics, even if they come to the United States, are still loyal to a foreign monarch that is the Pope, who is officially a monarch, and therefore can never be good citizens of a republic. And so they don't really like native-born Catholics either, and they don't really dislike foreign-born Protestants. So in the nativist party, you can't be an official member if you are a Protestant from Ireland, but you can hang out with the nativists if you are a Irish-born Protestant, and in fact, many Irish-born Protestants do, um, as well as Protestant Germans and other Protestant immigrants. So officially, it is not a religious movement unofficially, Realistically, it is an anti-Catholic movement. 
Right, and you describe how initially there is some sense among Catholics who have families that go back a little while in the U.S. that they might be able to get in on sort of the anti-immigrant movement as well, but, but that doesn't go so well for them. Yeah, so it's interesting. There's a bit of a split in the Catholic community between descendants of English Catholics. Uh, there are a good many in Maryland and, and some in Washington, D.C., of course, which is, you know, used to be part of Maryland, the part that, that remains in D.C., uh, uh, there are others in uh, Philadelphia, there are others in Louisiana, and in some of those places, not so much in Philadelphia, but more in Washington and in Louisiana, there are a few Catholics who show up and say, hey, we're native born, our grandparents were here, they fought in the revolution, can, can we join? And that lasts a month or two. And I think, you know, I can just imagine them sort of showing up at these meetings and hearing the speaker denounce the Pope and then the next speaker denounce the Pope and they're thinking, I, I think I'm in the wrong room, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave now. Um, so you see their names sort of disappear from the uh, mastheads of the newspapers and the other kinds of records. And at the same time, um, in Philadelphia, you have, again, these sort of older established Catholic families who get into some squabbles with an increasingly Irish-born clergy. Um, there's a fight that goes on in, in Philadelphia in the 1830s, and they end up being pushed back together, where some of the same people who were arguing with the bishop about the role of trustees in Catholic churches in Philadelphia end up responding to his call to respond to the nativists. And so I think it pushes Irish-born and American-born Catholics closer together against this common enemy. Interesting. Yeah, and, and how much were these conflicts over Catholicism and Protestantism, especially as it related to Irish people in America, how much were these influenced by uh, conflicts going on in Ireland at the time with, with England? And how much was this even sort of an imported conflict? <laughs> So I, I think there are very strong connections across the Atlantic connecting the United States to Ireland, to England, and to Canada. And so one of the key events here is in 1829, the British Parliament passes what was called the Catholic Emancipation Act that gave Catholics rights of voting, of office holding, that they had previously been denied. The main champion of this was an Irish-born Catholic lawyer named Daniel O'Connell who was elected to parliament. He originally could not take his seat in parliament because no Catholics were allowed. And then after the passage of the act, he's able to become a member of parliament. And Irish Catholics around the Atlantic Rim celebrate this. Irish Protestants too uh, initially support O'Connell. They see him as a great figure for Irish patriotism. He's not working for Irish independence, but he does work for a restoration of Irish autonomy within the British Empire. He wants to repeal the Act of Union and his cause becomes known as repeal. Um, and so he becomes you know, a very polarizing figure because nativists, Levin prominent among them, see O'Connell as some kind of agent of the Pope who is going to try to spread Catholicism into North America. And again, it's very unpleasant to read these, you know, century and a half old conspiracy theories full of hatred and falsehoods, but uh, that was my job for a while. Right. And, um, you know, trying to understand uh, how honest, how sincere Levin was is a very difficult task, but he really hated O'Connell and I think used that conspiracy theory to build the circulation of his newspaper and to build up the movement. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's more comforting or the opposite to see the way that these sort of outlandish conspiracy theories flourished, you know. It's not comforting. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, because you describe even, you know, there seemed to be a lot of sort of fantasies that O'Connell would somehow come over from Ireland to the U.S. despite, you know, having no concern with what was going on in the U.S. Oh, he so. did, though. I mean, oh, that's the did. thing. Okay. The, the, the uh, connections went both ways. So most famously, O'Connell was also an opponent of American slavery. Oh, okay. And he uh, wrote letters, he gave speeches telling the Irish in America, you should oppose slavery. Mm -hmm. This is an incredibly controversial moment in uh, the 1840s America where people are you know, seeing the country begin to split apart over the slavery issue. Mm -hmm. So for a British member of parliament who's a Catholic to be telling immigrants how to vote is kind very... Into their fears. Yeah, it, it's very threatening mm -hmm. to people like Levin. And it's also very threatening to a lot of Irish immigrants. So O'Connell loses a bunch of support among Irish immigrants when he says this because they don't want to be portrayed 
as doing the bidding of a foreign politician. Right, right. So yes, we are, in the 1840s, uh, American history is world history. It, it, that's true in the 18th century, it's true today. Um, and this is one of the sort of trends in the writing of American history that I'm working with is to understand America as inextricable from a larger context. Right. But then some of the fears even got to the point of imagining sort of Irish annexation of parts of the US or something like that, right? Or papal annexation, yeah, right? Papal and annexation, that, right. Um, and, and it is, again, hard to pick apart how much of this was anti-Irish, how much of this was anti-Catholic. You know, these days we talk about intersectionality, and I think that's useful, that for people like Levin, the term Irish Catholic was almost one word. Right. You know, do you, if we were to wake him up and say, what is it, do you, do you oppose Irish, do you oppose Catholics? He'd say, yes, I hate Irish Catholics. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, so it really is a, a blending of categories. So in addition to the religious component, um, there's absolutely, for example, an economic component. Mm -hmm. These are hard times. Um, you may have heard of the Panic of 1837. Well, that, that started in 1837, it did not end. It was a, a multi-year depression. Um, you have unemployment, you have a lot of American workers not finding jobs or seeing their wages cut. Who are they gonna blame? Oh, let's blame the Irish immigrant for working for less than we would right. take. And so there is economic anxiety, there's ethnic anxiety, there's religious anxiety tied together. Yeah, and how are these Irish immigrants fitting into the party system of the time? So initially, both parties, the Whigs and the Democrats, are making bids for them. But over the course of the 1830s and into the 1840s, more anti-Catholics, more nativists are on the Whig side, and the Irish see this, and they begin to become a Democratic voting bloc um, as they remain you know, into most of the 20th century. And so it, it becomes a kind of reinforcing cycle, where the more the Irish vote Democratic, the more the Whigs say, oh, we don't like this immigration because they're building up the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, within the Democratic Party, you have a lot of native-born Democrats who see those party offices, who see those public works jobs going to Irish immigrants, and they become upset. And so there's actually a fracture within the Democratic Party where some Democrats are leaving the party, not to join the Whig Party initially, but to start this new nativist movement. So the nativist party in Philadelphia pulls both Whigs and Democrats into a third party. Right. Um, yeah, I wanna turn now to George Codwallader. Codwallader. <laughs> uh, he's a leader in the Pennsylvania militia and um, he's, he's sort of the other central figure of this story. Um, can you tell me some of his background and how it's, it sort of intersects with the, the rise of public unrest in the U.S. during this period and the evolution of militias and military and police in the U.S.? So in, in some ways, George Cadwallader is the very opposite of Louis Levin. I, I think of them as kings on the chessboard where they're you know, very far away but sort of pushing their pawns at each other. Uh, Cadwallader comes from a very well-established family. Um, his ancestor, John App Cadwallader, had been recruited directly by William Penn to help found the colony, one of the you know, first Quaker arrivals in uh, the new colony of Pennsylvania in the late 17th century, and the Cadwalladers you know, continued to be important players. They're still there today um, in Philadelphia. Um, and they're you know, as close as you can get to an aristocracy in the United States. They hold high offices. George's grandfather had been a major general. His father had been a major general. They have a lot of money. They're close to the Penn family. They, they manage property that the Penn family has in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and so are, are basically collecting a lot of rents from them. Uh, George, you know, is He's got the best horses, he's got the best dogs, he's got the best wine, he's got the best of everything. He, he didn't have to work and he didn't have to do public service. He could have just clipped his coupons, but he's more industrious than that. So not only does he work um, with, again, financial affairs, but he also serves. And for him, that means military service. He's not interested in politics, but he's very interested in the militia. I think he joins as a teenager or maybe in his early 20s and rises through the ranks. And he's elected at a, a pretty young age, still in his 30s, to be the brigadier general for the brigade that covers uh, the city. And that is an elective office. The militia is electing its officers at this point, and he has to campaign for it. Um, the militia is a confusing word now. You might think about the militia being a bunch of guys with matching shirts in the woods. You might think of them as being the National Guard. People were every bit as confused in the 1840s, if not more. Uh, there are officially two militias in Pennsylvania. There's the ordinary militia, which is every white man 
of military age capable of bearing arms. They meet once a year. They hate it. It's a you know, day without pay for them. They're mocking their officers. They're showing up with broomsticks instead of guns. Um, they are, you know, complaining about this mandatory service. And then you've got the voluntary militia who are the people who want to be there. And you can think of them as like the volunteer firemen today who, you know, want to be there. They train. They're good at their jobs. Um, they've got uniforms. They've got high morale. And these are the groups that Cadwallader can deploy if trouble starts. Um, officially, they are there to repel foreign invasion, which is not impossible. Uh, George Cadwallader's father had been in the War of 1812. His grandfather had been in the Revolution. No one's sure if there's going to be another war or not with Britain. That right. Various crises going on. But increasingly in the 1830s and 1840s, it's this voluntary militia that is called out not to fight foreign enemies, but to put down riots. And there are a lot, a lot of riots in the 1830s and 1840s. Yeah, what can you tell us about the, the sort of rise in unrest in the yeah. US around the 1830s? That's about when it sort of gets pretty Yeah, scary. so you know, if people uh, here have been through the year 2020, uh, they may remember a, what felt like a wave of unrest across the United States. I believe more than 30 states deployed National Guard troops as a result of that. And this is a pattern that a lot of rioting does happen in waves. We had one in the you know, 1960s, uh, starting in 1964, going to about 1970. Uh, we had an earlier one, say, in 1919 here in Washington, a race riot. And there were other riots around World War I. And there, one of the first great riot waves starts in the 1830s and continues uh, into the 1840s. And this was quite shocking to Americans, because the 1810s and 1820s, there were certainly a few riots, but nothing like the constant drumbeat. And there were election riots where people were fighting over access to the ballot box. There were work riots where there were strikes and uh, or rival laboring groups. There were um, religious riots, such as the burning of the convent in Charleston, Massachusetts. And there were many, many attacks, both on African American communities and on abolitionists. And that was the, the number one cause of rioting. Um, and again, uh, the police, there weren't really professional police forces in the way that we know them now that had started in London in the 1820s and people in the United States were looking to London but hadn't quite gotten there. Uh, so there were very small police forces. Uh, a sheriff could call a posse where you just start grabbing men off the street, handing them sticks or guns, depending on what you have, and little white badges saying, you're in my posse now. Uh, that works a couple of times. And then as those posses get attacked, it's harder for a sheriff to find willing volunteers. Um, there's a, a scene in, earlier in the 1840s where a sheriff rounds up his posse, and he charges forward, and he looks behind them, and there's no one there. Um, and he, he gets beaten uh, quite badly um, by the mob. Um, and then if worse comes to worse, there's some militia. But again, the militia doesn't really want to be there. They're there to fight the British or the French or the Spanish, not to fight their fellow Americans. And so um, you have a lot of debate and uncertainty about what exactly the militia is supposed to do. But increasingly in the 1830s, the militia will show up and help the sheriff arrest people. For the most part, they're not firing their guns, uh, but they might club people with the butts of their muskets or take some kind of forceful action to try to restore order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found I found the story you relate of Pennsylvania Hall sort of emblematic of, of sort of how out of control this was, how, how much it was often focused on anti-abolition sentiment. Um, so, so Pennsylvania Hall was this sort of grand new debate hall, more or less, that was built in Philadelphia. And then what happened <laughs> shortly so after. This was a, um, a debate hall, a lecture hall built um, with money from abolitionists, both African-American and white, uh, very lavish gas lighting carpets, all the rest. And the d idea was not only to have a place for abolitionists to give their speeches, but also to rent it out uh, in the days before Disney Plus. I mean, this was the main form of entertainment people had was to go to these lectures. That's one of the ways that Levin gains prominence is by being such a good lecturer. Um, it officially opens on May 14th, 1848. On May 17th, so three days later, um, someone breaks a window, sneaks in, and cuts the gas lines. So this is, you know, gas illumination, lights a match, and the whole building burns down. Uh, the militia shows up. 
but they can't really do anything. It, you know, there's just some teenager who ran in and ran out. Um, one of the militia officers who shows up is uh, Colonel Augustus Pleasanton, who becomes a, a sort of secondary character in my book. Um, he is a, someone who's always wishing for a little more gunfire. He's a very aggressive officer. Um, keeps a diary in beautiful handwriting, God bless him. Um, but uh, it, it can be read in two ways. On the one hand, it is a continuation of an English rioting tradition where instead of attacking people, you attack buildings. Uh, we see this, for example, in the Stamp Act riots in 1760 where uh, Thomas Hutchinson's house is torn down. Uh, Paul Gillia has written about the 1812 riot in Baltimore where a newspaper office is destroyed, but no person is hurt. And so in that sense, you know, maybe it's not so bad. On the other hand, this was a $40,000 building. That's a lot of money. And a lot of people in Pennsylvania and really around the country are appalled that you can't have this building built, and especially that it, it is seen as an attack on free speech, um, just the way an attack on a printing press would be. Right. So this is one of many events in Philadelphia that make people think that the city is losing control um, there's a cartoon done called The City of Brotherly Love that's ironic because it's then a picture of a bunch of very famous riots and murders mm. that are, are taking place in Philadelphia in the 1830s and 1840s, and William Penn, the ghost of William Penn, is just shaking his head, yeah, like, wow. what, you know, what's going on here? Yeah. And so Cadwallader, as militia commander, is in something of a fix, where on the one hand, he kind of knows that people don't want him to just show up and shoot everyone. On the other hand, he also knows that if he shows up and doesn't shoot at anyone, he'll get criticized for that too. Right. So we see him sort of calculating and thinking how much force is appropriate, when do I show up? He doesn't want to use any force until it is unambiguous that that force was necessary. Hmm. Yeah, so I think I think we have sufficiently maybe set the stage for the, for the actual 1844 riots. So, um, what can you tell us about how, how they began? And so, yeah, there, there are two waves of riots in 1844, um, one to the north of the city of Philadelphia and one to the south of the city. Um, Philadelphia today is, is very large. It's all of what was then Philadelphia County, but in the 1840s, it's still just two square miles with a much larger metropolitan area. And um, the city at proper has a little bit better police force. The outlying areas have, have very little in terms of constables or, uh, or police. So in May of 1844, this is right after that election in New York City I mentioned, right. where New York is gonna have a nativist mayor. He hasn't been inaugurated yet, but people are very excited. Um, in Philadelphia, the nativist party holds outdoor rallies. They hold one at Independence Hall. They hold a bunch around the city. And then they decide we're gonna hold one in the third ward of Kensington, which is the densest Irish Catholic neighborhood in the whole county. Mm. So this was a provocation. Well, this is the thing. It's, it's right on the edge. Mm -hmm. And this is a big theme of the book, is that in the Constitution, it says we have the right peaceably to assemble. That's a basic part of democracy, is being able to go out on outdoors, give your talk and not be molested either by government forces or by a mob. If right. you don't have that, you, you don't have a functioning democracy. On the other hand, did you really have to like, go into an Irish Catholic neighborhood and give all of these speeches denouncing the Pope and right. immigrants and all the rest? So um, the uh, residents of the neighborhood, uh, they heckle, they jeer, and they eventually shove the nativists off of their stage and take down their plywood stage. Mm -hmm. And again, this is kind of within bounds. And this is something that, that sociologist Charles Tilley and, and others of his students have sort of thought about, is how do people know how to riot? There's a, a rough script, they often use theatrical um, uh, metaphors, where people kind of know what's in bounds and what's out of bounds, and probably this was within bounds. No one was hurt. There, there's actually an old man on the stage. They help him down before they tear down the stage. Mm -hmm. Go forward, that was a Friday. The next Monday, the natives come back. Louis Levin is there. Other prominent native speakers, they're coming back. They're gonna say, no, no, we have the right to speak. They give their speak. They're, the Irish show up, they dump a load of dirt. Again, it's, it's more like pranks than real violence. Mm -hmm. But then something happens. And this is something that we see in a lot of riots around the world, across centuries. A little bit of provocation sets things off. It could be a pane of broken glass that tends to set people off. It could be a gunshot. In this case, it's a thunderstorm. The 
skies just open up, everyone is drenched. They're out there on this vacant lot. They look around, where can we go to get dry? Well, the smart ones say, hey, there's a tavern half a block south, let's go in there and have a beer. Okay, good for them. The others say, there's a marketplace down the block, let's all run down there. Nativists, Irish, they run into this covered marketplace. There are already a bunch of Irish Catholic workers in the marketplace. There are words, there are fists, and then someone pulls out a gun. Mm -hmm. And this, again, is breaking the rules, because for a lot of these riots, even pretty nasty ones, where people are hitting each other with sticks and rocks and bricks and clubs and anything you can find on the streets of Philadelphia, they are not firing guns at each other. And I believe you point out that there was plenty of gun owners. There are a lot of guns in Philadelphia. Uh, Henry Derringer, you may have heard his name. He wasn't building pocket pistols then. He was building, uh, I think, full-size pistols and rifles. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, people have hunting guns. They have pistols. They have muskets. They are you know, training once a year for the militia. Everyone, in, in all the descriptions of this, I've never found anyone saying, oh, someone handed me a musket and I didn't know how to load it. Right. The assumption is that any adult man knows how to load and fire a musket. Um, and yet, for all of this, um, a lot of these riots make it through without any gunfire. But in this marketplace, someone, we don't know his name, pulls out a pistol and shoots a former constable in the face. He falls down, the face is bloody, and suddenly uh, the rules have changed. And so uh, the nativists somehow acquire weapons. Again, it's always a little blurry about what exactly happened. People didn't have video on their cell phones then. Right. Um, uh, there's a volunteer fire department across the way that unfortunately had just been, they had just opened this firehouse, they'd put in a new bell, and they were probably drinking a lot to celebrate it. They sort of rush over, get into the brawl, and there's a gun battle on the streets of Kensington. Um, that lasts until the evening, there's no real way to control it. People go home. It could have stopped there, mm -hmm. but then the next day, there's a big rally at Independence Hall, and the nativists, the sort of older, wiser men are saying, let's maybe go back next week. Mm -hmm. Let's Wait, calm, calm down, down. de-escalate. Yeah. And as they're talking, the younger men, the 19-year-olds, the 20-year-olds, are marching back to Kensington. Mm -hmm. They start another round of gunfire, um, and then there's a third day where it's less gunfire and it's more arson. They not only burn down that firehouse and a lot of Irish Catholic homes, they also burn two Catholic churches, uh, one in Kensington, the other in Philadelphia proper. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the militia eventually deploys. It takes a while. Again, Cadwallader isn't sure of his legal authority. He, he doesn't want to be seen as provoking anything. Um, the militia show up but they can't really do very much except watch these buildings burn. They try to protect the church. It's, they've got pretty small numbers. You know, you have two dozen militiamen, a few hundred people starting fires in lots of different places. All it takes, again, is one teenager to break a window, to light that match, and the whole church is going to go up. Right. So the militia, um, again, they, they, it's not to say they're completely ineffective. Um, but they are largely ineffective, and it's very embarrassing to Kedwalader. He doesn't want to have this happen again. That's May. Yeah. July, the nativists stage what I believe to have been the largest parade in Philadelphia's history up to that point. They don't do July 12th, which is the Battle of the Boyne anniversary. They've sort of learned the lesson. They don't want to be too British about this. No, they're going to do July 4th, be ultra patriotic, right. but also they parade the wounded of Kensington. They have the names of the men who died in Kensington. They have this big sort of grievance about what happened to them in Kensington. And they march right past the ruins of the church that they burned, and they also march past Catholic churches that they have not yet burned. Hmm. Amazingly, the city gets through this without any more violence. But one of those priests in those churches that got marched, he is stockpiling weapons. He is saying, we've got to defend the church. He and his brother, who happens to be a supporter of Daniel O'Connell, it's all woven together. They are stockpiling weapons. The next day, July 5th, their Protestant neighbors say, huh, the priest has muskets in the basement of the church. We've got to get them out of there. They're going to murder us in our sleep. So they surround the church. Another mob forms. And Ken Walleter is not going to let another Catholic Church burn. He's had two churches burn. He's not going to let a third burn. He comes down with the militia in full force. It's complicated. And he, at this point, he's getting yeah. in a little earlier in the He process. is getting in a little yeah. earlier, right. The, the, the idea is he can't wait until the fires is going. He's going to try to protect this church. Um, and he, he marches down. 
he scatters the mob, he leaves some troops to guard the church. When those troops are attacked the next day, Sunday, July 7th, he gets every militia man he can in Philadelphia. He summons them, not nearly as many show up as he wants. Some of them are out of town for July 4th, and some of them, quite frankly, are not going to risk their lives to defend a Catholic church. Right. But 180 do, and including some who, frankly, were probably nativists themselves, they say, even though we might have some sympathy with this mob, we are militiamen, we're going to do our duty. They march down, they form a perimeter around the church, and they try to clear it. And when someone throws a rock and knocks down a captain, they fire back. Hmm. And they fire into the crowd, killing some people. Now they're in this hostile territory. They have to sort of set up a perimeter and try to make it through the night. And they are attacked not only with bricks and stones, but also with muskets. And amazingly enough, three cannon wow. that the nativist mob steals from ships and shipyards along the Delaware River and fire at the militia, killing two of them. Um, and losing about 11 of their own. So you've got this nighttime battle, cannon on both sides, cavalry, sort of a miniature civil war going on in the streets of Southwark um, that lasts all night. And then Cadwalder's troops, there are no reinforcements, they kind of have to limp home uh, the next morning. And then all the troops from the rest of Pennsylvania basically come in and the city is under martial law for a few weeks. And this is just appalling, not only to people in Philadelphia, but really around the country. And again, you can, you know, it makes it down to the Australian newspapers a few months later that the United States is falling apart, wow. that democracy is failing. And, and this is pretty unprecedented at this point in both the, the mob sort of dedication to the fight as well as the calling of the militia and the use in this way. Right? Yeah, the, the, they had not seen anything like this since, I don't know, Shays' Rebellion, perhaps, might, right. or the Whiskey Rebellion. Even the Whiskey Rebellion looks a little mild compared to this, mm -hmm. um, because there it's mostly intimidation. This is, this is really um, a battle in an American city that had not been seen for decades. Not that many people killed. Between the two waves of riots, uh, it's maybe 20 people are dead, maybe 25. But again, if we're looking for comparisons, I might compare it to Kent State which you know, has four people killed, that's not very many people, but it is shocking to a nation then and 50 years later that these troops are firing on their fellow citizens. Um, the situation is somewhat different in that you know, in Philadelphia in 1844 in Southwark, the, you know, other people are firing at the troops as well. Um, but again, a lot of people are wondering, is this country going to last? Um, because they, they see the prospect of mob rule on the one hand, they also fear some kind of military dictatorship mm -hmm. where traditionally Americans have been very wary of standing armies, but what if you need to have um, troops all around? And eventually they get them. They don't call them troops, they call them a police force. Uh, First New York spins up a London style police force and then Philadelphia. And so you know, to some extent we are now accepting a level of uniformed armed forces in American cities that had not existed previously. Yeah, I think it's interesting the way that there are these separate strands of the possibility of a uniformed police force, a citizen militia, or a standing army. And it seems like at this point it could kind of go in any of those directions and it ends up being the police force for, for Philadelphia that becomes very like standardized and intended for these purposes, right? With the militia as backup. And that's right. still, again, what we have in 2020 is right. when the police force gets overwhelmed, they call in the National Guard. They don't expect them to get there immediately, but they you know, try to buy some time. What's vanished, of course, is the citizen posse. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, the events of the 1830s and 1840s are making Americans think we can't just expect men of goodwill to show up and subdue a riot um, because some of those people we were counting on are actually in the mob themselves. Right. Yeah, and then this is also tied into the consolidation of Philadelphia as well, right? There are issues with there being these separate cities that are part of what is now Philadelphia, where there are issues with police, ju or police with jurisdiction right. um, over where the militia can go, right? Yeah, so it's not a completely linear path, but prior to... Uh, the 1850s, Philadelphia was kind of like Los Angeles today, where you've got Los Angeles County, and then within that Los Angeles City, but also a bunch of other jurisdictions. Um, so Philadelphia County was fragmented, and it meant that Philadelphia City Police could not cross the street to break up a mob, or for that matter, to shut down a 
you know, uh, body house or some kind of illicit activity. Right. Uh, one of the many reasons that go into the consolidation of 1854 is to try to have a uniform police control over the entire county. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, this is, again, I don't want to have too simplistic a role, sure. but this is one of the reasons why city governments get a little bigger in the 19th century is to try to have greater order in uh, not only riot situations, but more generally. Makes sense. Um, yeah, so I think I have some more questions, but I wanted to open it up to the audience and see if anybody has uh, any questions. Um, raise your hand and someone with a microphone will, will come over um, and present it to you. And if not, I've got plenty more. All right, thank you. So, uh, quick question. In terms of a modern parallel, what do you see in terms of what happened recently that might be a great parallel to this incident in 1844? Is it the January 6th insurrection? Is it the firing on protesters in Lafayette Square, Charlottesville? And, and what lessons do you think we can carry forward to today? Yeah, so uh, this was a, an interesting project where I, I started it thinking that I was writing about rioting and that Philadelphia in 1844 would be an example of that because it is a, a pretty important moment in the history of riot control where again, the militia has a sustained battle against rioters. Uh, then as we got into the 2010s, 20 teens, as I was working on this, immigration resurged as an issue in American politics, obviously. Uh, these days there are, I would say, two parallel streams of nativist thought. One is more about economic competition and a lot of that hostility is addressed to immigrants from Latin America. Oh, there are so many of them, they're gonna take our jobs. And another is Islamophobic. They're more religious nativism. Oh, those folks are gonna impose Sharia law. So I was seeing those and thinking, oh, those are really combined in the 1840s where the Irish Catholic, you know, boogeyman is both of those fears together. So I sort of steered it more as an immigration story. And then 2020 happened. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I'm trying to finish this manuscript and it, it's reshaping my thinking as I see again the National Guard. I mean, we had seen this before um, in, in other cities in Baltimore, for example, um, the National Guard deployment there, but um, certainly many more uh, National Guard deployments. And I thought, okay, I need to talk a little bit more about the role of police, the more about um, mobs and mob rule. And then as I'm, you know, got the deadline, I'm supposed to finish this book, send it off, January 6th happens, and it's a nativist mob confronting the police and the National Guard. And I thought, okay, I guess, I guess it is really one story. And uh, if you look at President Biden's inaugural address, um, I think it was New York Times does a feature, what, are the, what d words does this inaugural address use that no other inaugural address has used? One is riotous mobs, and the other is nativist. Um, and so it really does come together in January 2021, 20, bringing both the nativist and the mob stories together. The other place where I think this comes together, and this, this goes back um, further, is if you read Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville, he's in America a little bit before this in the 1830s. And, but he's hearing about mobs in America, and he's thinking, of course, about the French Revolution, multiple revolutions that he wrote about, um, you know, not only 1789, but also 1832 and so forth. And uh, he writes this chapter on the omnipotence of the majority in the United States and its effects, something like that, where he puts this together. He says, you've got a real problem with democracy where it's very easy for majority to impose itself on a minority. And so I think he's thinking about racial minorities, religious minorities, political minorities, but he also very specifically references mob violence and what's going to happen, among other things, when the militia, which is supposed to represent the people, confronts the people. Will the militia uh, enforce law and order? He fears no, uh, based on what happened in Baltimore in 1812 when the militia refused to turn out. Interestingly enough, in 1844, the militia does turn out to defend a religious minority. And so I think maybe there's a little bit of hope there. Is 
that on. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This is a really uh, fascinating conversation. Um, I, I just wanted to ask about uh, commemoration because you mentioned the um, this kind of nativist groups using July the fourth for this parade. Um, did that become a regular thing for them? Do, do either side, nativists, Irish Catholics, do they commemorate the events of 1844? Does it become part of their rituals, or does it kind of sort of vanish? It's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure about rituals per se, um, but it certainly becomes part of the lore. So um, the nativists um, build a, a culture around their dead martyrs, uh, the most famous of whom was a young man named George Schiffler, who was the first to fall in Kensington. And here in the Library of Congress, you can find lithographs about the dead Schiffler. You can find poems about Schiffler and songs about Schiffler. And uh, they, his name gets commemorated. For example, there's a, a Schiffler Fire Company um, in Philadelphia, uh, in Southwark, that perpetuates the memory of this Protestant martyr, essentially. Um, so, you know, his memory lives on, and then he, he actually, there, there are some really bad novels and things that get written. Um, and then on, on the Catholic side, um, then certainly the churches that are burned become part of Catholic lore. And, you know, a lot of Americans, I had not heard of these riots um, prior to sort of coming across them while trying to study the history of rioting. The people who have heard of these riots are people who went to Catholic school in the United States, Catholic high schools, they know about this. Um, one of the uh, fairly rare public mentions of this came actually in 2016 when the Democratic National Convention met in Philadelphia. They were welcomed by Mayor Kinney, you know, good Irish Catholic stock, and he's got a few minutes on national television and he says, you know what happened here in 1844? Uh, they denigrated. Irish Catholic immigrants and attacked them, and, and you know we need not to ha we we can't let that happen again. So there absolutely are stories uh, that go down in both communities. Um, with you know the again the Irish Catholic story, it's more of an unbroken line. The Catholic historians, uh, you know, whose work I relied on a lot, um, preserving original documents, writing up these stories. I, I owe great debt to them. And then on the native side, Levin's faction fades pretty quickly. They, they've got a few seats in Congress, but they're a small fraction of Congress. They can't get the patronage jobs. They, they basically have to ally with the Whigs. They fade. But there are other nativist groups that form that use more of that fraternal organization idea that the Orange Lodges had, where not only are we going to be a political party, we're going to have rituals, we're going to have banners, we're going to have sashes. And they form what becomes the Know Nothing movement of the 1850s, which is much more successful in winning seats in Congress and state legislatures. They elect governors. Levin actually gets pushed out of that and, and dies in, in an insane asylum, actually. But um, there are ways that the movement of the 1840s fed into the much more successful and more ritualized movement of the 1850s. Just as a quick aside, do you know if it, in Philadelphia there are any sort of memorials or plaques to, to burn churches, or is it preserved in that way at all? So the, the two churches that were burned uh, were rebuilt, okay. and so I'm sure there are some plaques there, and they're more or less the same as, you know, they, they were built to resemble one. The one that was defended that burned accidentally in the 1890s and was also rebuilt, and, and I'm pretty sure there's a plaque there. Um, and then, um, I'm trying to think, the, the Kensington landscape has changed a lot other than the church. Um, you can see Independence Hall, obviously, that looks more or less the same as it did in the 1840s, and then there are various grave sites. Uh, George Cadwallader is buried in, at Christ Church, um, so I, I've been to his grave, I've not gone out to visit Levin's grave, because why? Um, uh, but it, it is interesting how, how, in some ways, how little of that landscape remains, the building that was Levin's newspaper office, is now the, the Museum of the American Revolution. Um, the site where uh, uh, General Patterson, Kidwalder's commander, had his house is now part of the Historic Society of Pennsylvania. So I've been on that spot doing my research, but that building was torn down. Right. Um, so it's a little hard. You know, of course, Philadelphia has other streets, the wonderful small streets where you can walk through and get a little better sense sure. of the city of the 1840s. Anyone else? Oh, up here. Thank you. Um, my question uh, regards uh, the role of agitators and provocateurs. The reason I'm interested is I took a, or a lecture, listened to a lecture on the danger of political violence uh, in upcoming elections here in the United States. Um, and one of the uh, 
former Ju uh, Department of Justice officials, very deeply knowledgeable about this, pointed out how um, not only stage managed, but strategic the provocation was of the violence in Charlottesville. And we're finding out more and more about what happened on January 6th. Um, that that is a real specific effort to provoke the use of force and then claim self-defense. Um, and I'm wondering from your history reading, like what, uh, what can you tell us about lessons of the real strategic use of agitators and prov provocateurs? Because it seems like that's something we really need to expose early, or at least talk about that this is something that happens. Um, because you even saw the use of, of sort of opposite party uh, National Guard troops being deployed to DC in 2020. So they were all very strategically picked from states um, and I think you can probably do that in DC in a way that you can't in other places, but it's this whole civil military blurry yeah. use of force area is very strategically manipulated. Um, and can you say anything about that? Yeah, so uh, great question. So one of the books that really struck me when, when thinking about this uh, is a book called Hate Spin by a communication scholar named Taryn George who looks at religious controversies in different countries, including the United States, and points out that people take offense very deliberately, that if you're trying to sell newspapers or gain television viewers or gain votes, it can be very advantageous to you to pretend to be offended in ways that you're actually not. And he uh, casts a pretty broad net about various religions. I, I won't name names here, but lots of different religious groups do this. They claim to be offended. And one of the things is they don't mind it if some of their young men are killed. So, you know, Schiffler um, becomes this martyr. You have these older men like Levin who will give the speech and then they sort of go out a side door and it's the 19 year olds and the 20 year olds who are left to fight and die. You talk about organization. One thing I didn't mention that I, I think I found out about Schiffler that people probably didn't know is he's almost certainly associated with one of Philadelphia's volunteer fire companies, which were essentially brawling organizations. They would go to a fire, whoever got to be at the fire plug, the fire hydrant first would get honor, so they would take their clubs and axes and try to hit the other fire companies. If there wasn't a fire, they would raid the other company's firehouse and chop its um, machinery to bits, its carriage. And so there's actually a fire riot in the middle of the Kensington riots. And so that's your organization where you already have these sort of gangs of young men Again, no Disney Plus, what are they gonna do on a Saturday night? They're gonna go out and fight. And older men like Levin, very strategically manipulating them. One of the things I tried to do at one point was, again, I have Levin and, and Cadwallader as these opposite kings. I was trying to see if they ever were in the same place at the same time. Because I really kind of wanted that. If I were a screenwriter, you'd have what's called the obligatory scene where you know, the Leonardo DiCaprio and Daniel Day-Lewis are finally face to face. And it doesn't happen. And I think the reason is that Levin leaves as the fighting starts and Ken Waller doesn't want to show up until the fighting has started, right? He doesn't want to be seen as a provocateur. And Levin, you know, he's not a complete physical coward. He gets into fights, but he, he knows when it's good for him to leave. So yes, I think there is a lot of deliberate manipulation of young men's aggression uh, on both these sides. On the militia side, you have this problem where the militia organizations are also kind of social clubs. And so you have an Irish Catholic company, the Montgomery Hibernia Greens, next to a Whig slash nativist company, the Markle Rifles. Officially, the Greens captain is in command. The Markle Rifle captain isn't gonna take his orders. And that's part of the reason things go badly. And after the riots, there's reorganization. One of the things is if you see, again, lithographs of these antebellum militia companies, a lot of them are wearing fantastic uniforms. They're wearing green, they're wearing uh, blue, they're wearing gray, they're even wearing red coats, which is not a very patriotic color, but whatever. Um, and you know, if you, if you know about like uh, First Bull Run, uh, some of these very colorful uniforms show up. After the riots in Philadelphia, Cadwallader tries to crack down. He says, everyone's gonna wear blue, like the US Army, and they start changing some of the company names. So the Montgomery Hibernia Greens, that Irish Catholic company becomes the Washington Guards or something. So they're trying to eliminate some of these political and ethnic distinctions to make the militia a more neutral force. 
Well, I think, I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here in person and online. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're watching online, you will get a survey uh, after this event is over in person. Uh, you, will, you will find some that we would love you to fill out here. Um, and then uh, Zach will be graciously signing books and we will be selling them in the room uh, right back there. So uh, please uh, come say hi and, and pick up a book. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.